A listener note. This episode contains adult content and language. This may not be suitable for all listeners. Hannah Warren died three months after Paolo operated on her. Her parents were heartbroken. She was just two years old. They wrote a beautiful post on Facebook almost immediately. They wrote about the largeness of her life, despite it being so short. After all, Hannah was hardly supposed to survive past birth, and the early days of new types of transplants are always fraught. As anyone knows from the history of medicine, you always lose patients, unfortunately, at the beginning of something like that. It happened with every transplant you can think of, heart transplants, lung transplants. There are going to be problems at the beginning. It's inevitable. It's a learning curve. And so they chose to see Hannah's, Hannah as a pioneer in this exciting field and that it, it was not all lost because at the start of it, they had been told that she wouldn't live past the age of six. With Hannah's death, Benita also had to make a decision about what to do with the documentary. Her plan to follow the inspirational story of a cutting-edge transplant surgeon that saved a baby's life no longer had a happy ending. Now what do we do? And we didn't know what to do, actually. And we tabled the story for a while. Benita and her colleagues decided they had to shift the documentary's focus dramatically. It felt wrong to take viewers on this ride and have it end with the death of this beautiful little girl that they've been watching for two hours. So for a while, we actually didn't know what to do. And then we started talking about trying to turn the story to focus a bit more on Paolo and on his work and some of the other patients. His determination in the face of tragedy fascinated her and made her more determined to finish the documentary. He kept saying to me, well, now I have an angel on my shoulder. And every time I go into the OR now to do another one of these surgeries, I know that Hannah's there with me. And I thought that was pretty incredible, actually. And that just made me fall more in love with him. To finish her documentary, she would have to continue working closely with Paolo. But her growing feelings for him posed a real ethical problem. So she turned to an old friend for advice. We were in her bedroom, and then that's when she told me. Annette Freeman had worked with Benita as a producer at NBC. I just look at Annette and I'm saying, what do I do? What should I do? I, I have this man who's crazy in love with me, who I'm crazy in love with, but... What do we do about the story? I don't, everything feels upside down, and I just don't know what to do. Annette told it to her straight. You can't. I mean, you, as a journalist, we just don't cross those lines. That's just something that we, we, we don't do. It's if you're covering someone, you're covering them in a objective way. Benita knew her friend was right, and she told Paolo she had to put the brakes on their romance. I said, we cannot be together until the story is finished because this is too complicated. I thought the story was done and now we have to do some more work and I just as best if we're not involved, we have to wait. And he was furious and really upset and he begged me, he begged me not to do this and please. But Paolo wouldn't give up. He would call, he would write me these pouty emails. This all is so hurting, heartbreaking, and sad that I cannot believe it you are doing this to me. But what is my fault to truly love you? And he ended it with a warning. I stop it here because I love you and realize that I am at a breaking point. You are about to cross the line. But I stood my ground and I just, I kept thinking, I can't until the story is over. I cannot see him. And so I didn't. But even her friend Annette, who was against the relationship, saw how hard Paolo was to resist. I believe in miracles. I believe in magic. I believe in love. And it just seemed like this is going to be good. Of course. Why not? We're pleased to have ADT as our presenting sponsor. While you're enjoying your latest true crime show, you can rest easy knowing 24-7 peace of mind is always near from the leaders in the home security category, ADT. U.S. News called ADT the best home security system of 2020, and it's easy to see why. ADT has received the most burglar alarm events in the industry and helps save more lives than any other home security provider. 
They've also got top-of-the-line tech, including security camera technology that can detect the difference between a pet and a person to help reduce false alerts. With nine owned and operated call centers and more experience in the industry than anyone else, no matter what you want to protect, nobody has more experience helping keep it safe than ADT. Help protect what matters most. Get all the latest security upgrades from the largest name in home security by visiting ADT.com today. ADT. Brilliantly safe. Join Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts or the Wondery app to listen to Dr. Death's Season 3, Miracle Man, early and ad-free. From Wondery, I'm Laura Beale, and this is the third season of Dr. Death, Miracle Man. This is Episode 2, The Secret Society of International Surgeons. A few weeks after she'd pushed Paolo away, Benita had been hit with her own medical scare. Her doctor had found growths in her uterus. She would need surgery to have them removed and tested for cancer. As she recovered in her hospital bed, she got two messages. First, from her doctor giving her the all clear. The growths were benign. And the other was from Paolo. He kept saying, can I come and see you? I want to come to the hospital. And I kept telling him no. But lying there in the hospital bed, Benita's resolve started to soften. And then I remember lying in that hospital bed. I just found out that I'm okay. I'd had this cancer scare, this big health scare. I'd been through so much that year. And I'm thinking, here's this man who is sitting in a hotel room half a mile, a mile away from me. I'm telling him, you can't see me, but he's sitting there because he loves me and he wants to know that I'm okay. And I just thought, this is stupid, you know? What is the most important thing in our lives, really, when it comes down to it? It's not work. It's love. We just, all of us want to be loved. And in that moment, I thought, I can't push him away. I'm not doing this. She texted him to come over. And so he shows up, (laughs) and he has a single red rose. And he just leaned over. He handed me the rose, and he kissed my cheek. And he said, I'm not going anywhere. Sitting beside her, Benita's mom was smitten. My mother was there, right? And she hadn't met him. And she was just totally enamored with him. I remember when he left that day, she was just sort of gushing. And, you know, he was kind of flirting with her, too, as he does. And he came back the next day, and he was, you know, he was walking me up and down the hallways in the hospital because after you have a major abdominal surgery, you know, it takes a little while to get up and walk. It's hard. And I remember other people, the patient next to me, commenting on how tender he was and how sweet he was. And from that point, I just gave in. At that point, we were done with the story. And at that point, I just surrendered. Journalistic ethics, her own better judgment. I just, I couldn't fight it anymore. I just wanted to be with him and I wanted to be wrapped in love. After that, things really took off. First, Paolo met her friends, among them Nancy, Karen, and Annette. He redecorated and painted the house, her apartment. (laughs) Who does that? (laughs) There was a famous beer commercial that was out for a while, and it was that type of scene where it was the most interesting man in the world. It was like they couldn't help but be drawn to him. He had a light around him as far as that just a a magnetic charisma that attracted anybody that would come. It was almost as if he was elevated a few inches and he could work the room, if you could visualize that. That's how good he was. He took them out to dinner and picked up the tab. And between courses, Paolo was the entertainment. Paolo asked him to play some bachata. I think it was some bachata. And we knew as Paolo wasn't really a dancer because Benita had said, you know, Paolo's not really a dancer. I wish he would. You know what I mean? This was going to be good. Anyway, Paolo gets up and gets Benita and starts doing bachata with her like a pro. Annette was blown away, but she didn't have time to think because now Paolo had locked eyes with her and started gliding across the floor. And then he comes to me and like, I dance some bachata with him. And then he goes to another one of our friends. He was dancing some bachata with us. And he was, I mean, he was really good. 
Paolo explained that in between running his clinical trial in Russia and doing surgeries all over the world, he had made some extra time for dance lessons. He said, I've been taking lessons in Russia secretly for about three months. I've been going three times a week. I said, what? <laughs> and he said, I did it for you. I know how much you love dancing, and I want to be able to dance with you. Paolo was a hit. I must have died. I was like, are you kidding me? This what? I mean, you want to talk about having somebody endeared to your heart for doing that. It was incredible. So that to me was <laughs> like, oh, Benita, he's great. <laughs> As they got closer, Paolo also let Benita into a secret. Aside from his clinical trial in Russia and his responsibilities at the Karolinska Institute, there was something else, a network of private, high-rolling clients he saw in secret. It's very quiet. It's very clandestine. It's really kept under wraps. When he told Benita who was on the list, she was blown away. World leaders. Hollywood celebrities. He told me that he had never told me this before because because of who these people were, it was vital to them to keep everything secret and clandestine. And he couldn't tell me any of this. They had to keep this under wraps. And that made sense to me because of who he was. He's this celebrity surgeon who works in these circles where he works with people who need him to be secretive. Whenever Paolo had to leave her to go see these private clients or go to Russia or go to his home in Barcelona, he made sure to keep in touch. He speaks six or seven languages, and he had about five or six cell phones. So he had all these cell phones, and he was always carrying all these cell phones with him. One time when he was in New York, one of Benita's friends asked him. And she said, why do you have so many phones? And so he said, well, I have the Russian phone for my work in Russia. I have the Swedish phone for my work in Sweden. I have the U.S. phone now because of all the time I spend with Benita. And then he had an Italian phone because he's originally from Italy and his ex-wife <laughs> was in Italy and his children were in Italy at the time. And then he had a Spanish phone. So he had at least five phones. And at that particular moment when my friend asked him about these phones, he was sitting at the kitchen counter and he had all five phones lined up on the counter. <laughs> and she said, why? How confusing is that? Why on earth do you need so many phones? And he just said, it just makes it easier. And then there were the vacations. Paolo took Benita and her daughter on a magical trip to the Bahamas. And then he and Benita jetted off on romantic getaways to Turkey, Mexico, Sweden, Puerto Rico. Are you sure we're not on our honeymoon? <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> what kind of night we're going to have. <laughs> <laughs> really? Turn it off now. <laughs> Paolo asked if Benita wanted to join him on a trip to Russia. And I had been telling him that I didn't think I could travel. She was having trouble clearing an infection from that surgery she'd had just a month before. But she'd never been to Russia and really wanted to go. So she checked with her doctor. And then... The infection cleared up enough that my doctor said, you're fine, you're okay to travel. They spent the trip sightseeing and shopping, but one night, as they settled down for dinner, it was clear the infection had not gone away. And I started having horrible pain, um, like piercing pain. At first, she tried to tough it out, hoping to make it through the dessert, but this was just too much. I remember squeezing Paolo's hand under the table, and I just look at him, and I say, my love, something's wrong. A look of concern flashed across Paolo's face. You're going to be fine, he said. He got up from the table, paid the check, and grabbed her coat. And I could barely walk, barely get in the taxi. They made it back to their hotel room. And he said, lie down on the bed. Benita quickly pulled off her clothes as best she could so he could see the wound. He looked at the incision, and he looked at me, and he said, do you trust me? And I just looked at him, and I said, get me another glass of wine. Paolo gave a soft smile and then walked to the mini fridge. He pulled out a bottle of wine, then filled a glass to the brim and handed it to her. Which I promptly slugged, and I lay down, and... He said, where are your scissors? I had these travel scissors that um, I was using to cut the gauze that I was covering the incision with. And I said, they're in the bathroom. 
and he goes in the bathroom and he gets my travel scissors and he used peroxide or something, whatever he had, to quote-unquote sterilize them. He came back over to her, looked her in the eyes. And he said, do you trust me? And I just nodded my head. And he took those scissors and he plunged them into my incision. Paolo told her that by opening the wound, he'd be releasing the pus from her incision and it would help her heal. She believed him because she trusted him. You know, we've been cooped up for a year and a half. But as more and more Americans get vaccinated, they're itching to get back to normal, fueling an exploding demand for services we've been missing, like gyms, nail salons, hotels. Millions of jobs will need to be filled. And to fill these roles fast, businesses turn to ZipRecruiter. And right now, you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com death. When you post your job on ZipRecruiter, they'll send it to over 100 top job sites, giving you access to their network of millions of job seekers. Then ZipRecruiter's matching technology scans resumes to find qualified candidates for you and proactively presents them to you. You can easily review recommended candidates and invite your top choices to apply for your job, which encourages them to apply faster. ZipRecruiter's technology is so effective that four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. And right now, you can try ZipRecruiter for free at this exclusive web address, ziprecruiter.com slash death. That's ziprecruiter.com slash D-E-A-T-H. Just go to ziprecruiter.com slash death. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Dr. Death is sponsored by BetterHelp. Sometimes life does not go as planned. The world can press down on you, back you into a corner or shut doors that you thought were open. Even your own feelings might be preventing you from achieving your goals. Talking to someone can help, but therapy? Maybe you're uncertain, reluctant, or don't even know where to start. BetterHelp is there for you. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist, someone you can begin communicating with in under 48 hours. But it's not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It's professional therapy done securely online. Log in to your account anytime and message with your therapist or schedule video or phone sessions. It's more convenient and more affordable than traditional therapy, and BetterHelp is committed to finding you the right therapist. Switch anytime, easily, and at no charge. Visit BetterHelp.com slash doctor. That's better H-E-L-P. Join the over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. Get 10% off your first month at BetterHelp.com slash doctor. In between romantic getaways with Paolo, Benita had been hard at work putting the final touches on the documentary about him called A Leap of Faith. Almost a year and a half after she'd first contacted him, it was finally done. A two-hour tribute to the power of regenerative medicine and the achievements of Dr. Paolo Macchiarini. It was set to air on NBC to an audience of millions, none of whom had a clue that the producer was also dating the main subject. Benita celebrated by renting a screening room and inviting a few dozen friends to watch. She sat in the back with Paolo. The lights dimmed and the movie started. Meredith Vieira hosted the special. A mischievous toddler, a former dancer, a boy with a beaming smile, these are the brave patients who are stepping up in the name of science. If I don't survive, this is going to help other people. And he's the daring doctor who is determined to give them that chance. And I think everybody was in awe of him because what they knew about him from what I'd said, it was one thing to hear me say he's doing these groundbreaking transplants and this little girl and this, that, and the other thing. But to watch the entire special and understand just how big this was and what this meant and the potential and how groundbreaking and risky and radical what he was doing was and what a pioneer he was really took everybody's breath away. Some people cried. Some came up and thanked him. Others gave him hugs. And I remember one of my friend's mothers was there and she gave him such a big hug and, and thanked him for the work he was doing and thanked him for being willing to do things that no other medical people were willing to do. And it was just like he was the hero that night. With the release of the movie, Paolo and Benita's relationship was out in the open. And now, they weren't just dating. On Christmas night, 2013, 
Paolo, Benita, and her daughter had been home together. As they sat around beside the tree, Benita could tell that something was up. Her daughter had a conspiratorial smile on her face. Paolo handed Benita a small box. And my daughter starts giggling. And I kind of looked at her and I said, what's funny? Her daughter grinned and told her to open it. I hear my daughter giggling in the background. And so I open this gift and it's this beautiful ring. And the second I looked at the ring, I knew what it was. It wasn't just any ring. It was a gorgeous diamond ring. And I kind of looked up at him and said, is this what I think it is? And he said, yes. And I was speechless literally speechless. My fingers were almost shaking a little bit as I rip off this paper and I'm kind of very slowly opening the box. And then when I opened it and saw this gorgeous ring sitting there, I just was, wow. The whole scene was so touching just because we were at home and it was just the three of us and it was so intimate. And it's not the way I ever would have imagined. Paolo and Benita were engaged. He had a charisma to him, an energy. When he walked in the room, he sort of had a palpable charisma, that kind of thing you can't make up. Amanda Fox had known Benita for close to a decade. They'd met back when she was also a producer at NBC. She loved seeing her friends so comfortable with her new boyfriend. I hope she doesn't hate me saying this, but I don't think she would, that she's a very put-together person physically. She's always completely put together, makeup perfect, hair perfect, you know, everything, outfit perfect. And she showed up kind of not perfectly put together. She was tired, you know, she was um, kind of ruffled and, you know, her makeup wasn't perfect. And and for anyone else, it wouldn't be worth noting, but is not typical for her. And he showed up and she just said sort of, hi, how are you? And sort of put her feet up on his lap. But still, something about him felt off. There was a certain way that he acted that was more than confidence. He seemed arrogant. When she and her husband had them over, Paolo dominated the room. Literally the way he sat in a chair, you know, he'd just gotten to my home, just sort of leaning back with his arms spread wide and just like it was his house kind of thing. I don't know how to describe it. It was more of a hunch. She wasn't sure if there was enough to say anything to Benita. I was nervous about saying anything to her friends because I felt like I was the only one who was having doubts and I didn't want to sort of burst anyone's bubble. So she floated her concerns with Annette. Just when we were sort of comparing notes on Paolo, when I had some concerns about him and my impression of him was very different from theirs. So I don't know if this is universal. Amanda decided not to raise it with Benita. I just kept my mouth shut. Instead, she watched as the wedding planning began. So he had told me all along that he wanted to get married in Italy. This was very important to him. And that he wanted to have a big Catholic wedding. And I said to him from from day one, I said, well, how's that going to work? Because I'm not Catholic, and I don't know that much about the Catholic religion, but I know it's Italy, and I know the churches are very strict, and I don't think it's that simple. And he kept saying, oh, don't worry, we'll figure it out. They scouted villas in Tuscany together, which took Benita's breath away. But Paolo wasn't satisfied. He wanted things to be more grand, more elaborate. And that was stressing Benita out. So one day, Paolo came to her with another different kind of proposal. He said, listen, I would like to propose something. He said, let me take over the wedding planning. Benita was taken aback. And I kind of went, what? (laughs) And in my head, I'm thinking... Okay, wait a minute. What man knows how to plan a wedding? And isn't that supposed to be part of this whole thing for me? And I said, you know, I don't know. I don't know about that. But Paolo insisted. When he said that, he had that smile on his face. And all I want you to do is find your dress and show up and look beautiful. That's all you have to worry about. There was just one little condition. He made me promise. He said, if you agree to this, these are the rules. You don't ask me any questions. I tell you what you need to know when you need to know it, and I need you to be okay with that. Paolo was the master of surprise. Surprise gifts. Surprise trips to unknown destinations. But this, this was another level. And so I said, okay, okay, I promise. I I just, I won't ask any questions. And it was hard. I mean, I had to stifle 
the questions many times. I had to stifle the urge to Google things and look things up. And I just didn't because I'd made this promise to him. And of course, there was part of me that loved the idea of being surprised. I love surprises. And the anticipation of what he was going to do and what this was going to be like was exciting. All Benita was going to have to do was not ask questions. But Paolo was having a bit of a problem. He wanted a Catholic wedding, but had been divorced. And so had Benita, and she wasn't even Catholic. He said, I still can't find a place for us to get married. I can't find a priest that will marry us. And again, I said, okay, what are we going to do? What do you want to do? But Paolo had a plan. And he said, I'm going to call in some favors in Rome. And I said, okay. And I knew that Paolo had contacts at the Vatican. He told Benita that he'd actually helped treat Pope John Paul II and that the current pope was part of his list of VIP patients. And so when he said, I'm going to call in some favors and talk to some people in Rome, I said, where are you going? And he said, I'm going to go to the Vatican. I said, okay. And he said he was going to the Vatican to see if he could get someone there to help us find a priest that would marry us. And he said, there must be somebody, you know, the Vatican must be able to find somebody and bend the rules a little bit, even though you're not Catholic. And I'm going to find somebody that will marry us. The next day, Benita was at work at NBC offices in Rockefeller Center in New York when she got a call from Paolo. And he asked me to step out and um, he said, I have amazing news for you. Um, He said, I found somebody. They found somebody. They're going to help us get married. And I said, that's great. Paolo told her to sit down. I said, I'm standing in the lobby of Rockefeller Center. There's nowhere to sit down. And he's kind of sounds a little bit giddy, like a little schoolboy. He's all excited. And I thought, what is he about to tell me? What Paolo told her was almost impossible to believe. So incredible, in fact, she would later have a hard time convincing some of her friends. And he wants to, he's Italian, he's Catholic, he wants to get married in the church. She FaceTimed with a few friends, including her friend Lee, who lived on the other side of the world in Australia. And she recorded the conversation for posterity. And um, I was raised Episcopalian, and so he spent a day in Florence about a month ago going to different churches, trying to find one that he liked. Couldn't find anything that he liked, or they wouldn't do it because of the different religions. Um, So he said, I'm going to go and talk to my contacts in Rome. Okay. In the Vatican. Oh, you're spoiling the story. <laughs> no, no, I want a reaction. <laughs> so, wait. So, this is, I said before he left, I'm like, so who are you talking to in Rome anyway? Where are you going in Rome anyway? He said, the Vatican. I'm like, oh. <laughs> I oh, said, no, yeah. wait, wait. So, this, I said, who are you talking to at the Vatican? Il Papa. I what? <laughs> I'm a Catholic, I can say that. Right. So he goes and talks to the Il Pope. Papa. So um, he's in there for four, four hours. And I'm like, what the heck is he talking to him about for four hours? I'm losing my mind. So he calls me and he and I'm on my way to work. But he said in the, somewhere in the middle of this conversation, you know, he had said, I'd be happy to help you find a place. But then in the middle of the conversation, he said, what if I do it? No, 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 I'm not joking. We're getting married by the Pope. (laughs) In truth, Benita hadn't believed Paolo either when he first told her. But then she Googled it. And actually what popped up, ironically enough, was that Pope Francis had very recently married a whole group of couples at the Vatican. And in the news reports about him marrying these couples, they even said things like, the Pope just married however many couples who were living in sin and... These were all couples who were, quote-unquote, living in sin for one reason or another. They'd been divorced or whatever. And so I read that, and I thought, huh, okay, so it's not completely implausible. Besides, Paolo was so excited about it. And what with the extravagant trips, the celebrity friends? This is Pope Francis, who was extremely progressive and, you know, is trying to move the church out of old traditions and be more open-minded and be more open in general. And so I thought, okay, maybe this kind of makes sense. (laughs) Lee, Lee, you and I are talking because we're planning a trip. But, and this is where, this is where it gets a little bit serious. He said he would be happy to do this for us, but he had one small request. 
which yeah, is that we will be, because Paolo's also divorced, we will be the first divorced couple that he has ever married in a church. <sighs> and he wants us both to take communion, which no divorced couple has ever... Can you imagine that? ...ever been allowed to do in a church. So this is like history making. And I have to go to the Vatican and do confession with him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> so, now... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It'll take it that long to do the confession, won't it? So the Pope himself was going to marry them in Italy. And that wasn't all. So now, now because he's doing this, now the, the Obamas are coming. Oh, we, we'll, t- we'll take a spare pair yeah, of spare I don't know who else right. is coming, but um, John Legend is singing in the church. <laughs> Anyway, needless to say, this has turned into... Over the coming days, she told more friends. And so I felt like every time I told somebody, it it took a minute for them to wrap their heads around it. But everybody believed him. Everybody, except for Amanda. I said that, you know, that sounded insane. Benita gave her all the same reasons. He was the Pope's doctor. This was a personal thanks. And I told my husband about it right away, and we both thought it sounded completely absurd. And my husband was instantly doubtful. But his one famous line was when, at some point along the way, he said, either the Catholic Church is about to go up in smoke or Benita's life is. But it would be Paolo's life that was about to be turned upside down. In Wondery's new podcast, Killer Psyche, former FBI agent Candace DeLong dissects the motivations of the most terrifying criminals in history. In her most recent episode, Candace reviews the case of Eileen Warnos, a serial killer who murdered seven men but claimed they were all in self-defense. Stick around to the end of this episode to hear a preview of Killer Psyche. It was Thanksgiving. And Benita was about to introduce Paolo to her father for the first time. The day Paolo was due to arrive in New York, Benita was scrolling through her phone when she read a New York Times headline that stopped her cold. Leading surgeon is accused of misconduct in experimental transplant operations. And the article basically says that he's being accused of scientific misconduct at Karolinska. And that's very serious. And, I mean, it's in the New York Times. Obviously, it's very serious. A prestigious medical institute in Sweden has begun an investigation of a surgeon who's considered a pioneer in the field of regenerative medicine. After complaints that he did not receive ethical approvals for experimental operations on patients and misled medical journals about the success of the procedures, Benita started thinking about how Paolo had been very different lately, on edge. He'd been behaving really weirdly for about a month, and he'd been alluding to these people that were trying to take him down and and these people that were jealous of him. When she asked him about it, all he would say was, I hate this guy, and, you know, he wants to do me in, and I'm going to get him back, and it was was nasty. The doctor's name was Calais Grinamo. I remember him sitting on the bed one time on his laptop, and he had some papers next to him, and... He read something, and he started swearing, and he slammed the laptop down, and he threw these papers all across the bed and the floor, and I was like, what the hell? And he just said, I can't stand this man. He wants to take me down, and I'm not going to let it happen. She had never seen Paolo like this, angry, bitter, and out of control. Now, reading about how serious these allegations were in the New York Times of all places, she started to get angry. I was pissed. I was really angry. I'm his fiance. I've been by his side through everything. I've been listening to him complain about this doctor, and I felt like he was hiding something from me. When Paolo hit the ground in New York, he called her. He called me when he got off the plane and, you know, hi, my love, I landed. And the first thing I said to him, I said, what is this thing in the New York Times? And why don't I know about it? Why haven't you told me about this? Oh, we'll talk about it when I get there, blah, blah, blah. I just didn't want to upset you. They went to visit Benita's family as planned, but soon it became clear that Paolo's thoughts were elsewhere. At one point, they were at Benita's brother's house, and Paolo got a phone call and walked out of the room to take it. He went outside to talk on the phone, and he came back in, and my sister-in-law says he was crying, like almost sobbing crying. 
And so everybody knew that something was very wrong. And it was then that I knew I had to help him. Paolo had been there for her when she needed him. Here was an opportunity for her to help him. I thought, you know, he's being unfairly attacked and I need to help him. She took charge of the situation. They went back to their luxury hotel with its spiral staircase, Baroque-styled furniture, and turned the dining table in their suite into a war room. I had my computer up, and I have a notepad, I have pens, and he's sitting on the other side of the room on his own laptop, and we're both working furiously. Benita knew that Paolo's procedures were controversial, but she'd seen his passion and determination firsthand. She believed in what he was doing. He was angry, you know, like he was like, fuck this and fuck that journalist and I'm going to, you know, screw him for asking me this. This was a feeling that sort of enveloped this whole room that if he'd been at the top of his game, it felt like things were starting to cave in. You know, it felt like the walls of the room were starting to kind of cave in around us. She tried to calm him over the next few hours as she went through all the emails coming into him, asking him for a comment or an interview. I remember there was one science journalist who had written a long email and the questions were very well-researched and very direct and very troubling to read because he was questioning all kinds of things. And I stopped more than once and I looked at Paolo and I said, why is he asking you this? And how does he know this? And how has this gone from scientific misconduct to he's questioning, you know, this about that transplant and this about that transplant? She helped respond to almost every single request that came in. She hoped that that would be the end of it and that they could put this behind them. As the storm over the article subsided, Paolo seemed to calm down. A few weeks later, he sent her seven roses to mark seven months until their wedding day. With the Pope now officiating their wedding, the reception was getting bigger and more ambitious. Paolo would text her updates. He's going to Italy for two days to meet with the Swiss Guard and to meet with the Vatican, mm. to meet with Secret Service. Benita could barely keep track of all the developments. Now there were more events, more guests, more dresses. I needed a red carpet dress for Friday night. I needed two different dresses for the wedding because he wanted me to have my wedding dress. And then he wanted me to have an elaborate dress for the dance that we were going to do. He wanted this very elaborate wedding dance. And he wanted me to come out in this beautiful ball gown. And then he wanted to be able to rip the skirt of this ball gown off to reveal this sexy little dance number underneath for one of these dances that we were going to do. I became so focused on all these dresses and all these things I had to get and all these, you know, organizing all of that and the invitations that I was happy to let him take over the planning of the wedding and keep going with that. But as the day drew closer, a knot was forming in Benita's stomach. He said that he wanted my daughter and I to move to Barcelona. He had this beautiful home, and he didn't want to be traveling all the time, and it would be easier if we came and lived in Barcelona. She hadn't even been to Barcelona, for crying out loud, and not for a lack of trying. We'd plan a trip to Barcelona, and then all of a sudden he had a surgery and we couldn't go, or his house in Barcelona was being worked on, there was always a reason. So this was always sort of looming in the background of, when are we going to Barcelona? But that was the one place that we'd never gotten to. And that meant she hadn't met his kids. And he just kept luring me with how beautiful life would be in Spain and this beautiful house he had and how I would be able to finally relax and I could still write from there. I could still work from there, but I wouldn't have the pressure of having to work and having to earn money, and he described Spain and Barcelona as so idyllic and such a, a lovely, relaxed way of life. So she agreed. I was going to leave my life in New York, leave my friends in New York, leave a job that I absolutely loved and had done very well at, and ride off into the sunset with him in Barcelona and embark on a whole new life. But she still wasn't ready to leave her job at NBC. The days ticked by until finally it was her last time walking into 30 Rockefeller. I had been there for 16 years, and I never imagined leaving. I never imagined walking away to go get married. The place was full of memories. My daughter took her first steps at 30 Rockefeller. The first time she heard about Paolo Macchiarini. I was consumed with trepidation and uncertainty and sadness and 
I had been so happy and so caught up in this blissful fairy tale and this magical romance and floating on clouds. And all of a sudden it hit me that day, you're walking away from this place. You may never come back. And the unknown and the uncertainty of what was beyond this was scary, actually. She wasn't getting cold feet per se, but the enormity of what she was doing struck her. Here she was, ready to leave her job, her home, her life, to be with a man she'd known less than two years. I mean, everything was at stake. I was giving up my career. I was giving up my job. I was moving my daughter to a foreign country. And all of a sudden that day, on my last day at work, I thought, what am I doing? I kind of had a panic attack. I thought, what am I doing? In these situations, Benita knew exactly what to do. The next morning at 9 a.m., Benita and a few of her closest friends arrived in Manhattan for a spa day. And the idea was that we were going to spend the morning at the spa, we would have massages, and we, you know, we would have a nice lunch just to sort of celebrate. They put their phones on silent and tucked them away into their bags so there would be no distractions. We all got massages, and they have this beautiful, very serene, relaxing lounge area where it has all the chairs that lean back, the massage chairs. And so we were all sitting there and I'm laughing my head off, like doubled over laughing. After the fourth time of being told to be quiet, they figured it was time to go. And so we get dressed and I go to the front counter to pay. I was treating all my girlfriends to thank them. And as I hand my credit card to the receptionist and at the same time I pull out my phone, True to her plan, Benita hadn't looked at her phone the entire time. And, you know, I'm sort of idling through my texts and whatever, and then I go to my email, and the first email that pops up, the subject line says, The Pope. The message was from a coworker, but something about the subject line sent a jolt of fear through her body. She opened the email. The Pope is not going to be in Italy on the date of your wedding. He is going to be in South America. And there's a link to a news story detailing his itinerary in South America. And it also says that this trip has been planned for quite some time. When I read this email, I felt like somebody punched me in the stomach. It was like all the air in my lungs rushed out. And I tried to take a deep breath. I thought I was going to throw up. She felt the world spinning all around her. And I think there was a tiny, tiny part of me that sort of fanciful, delusional, dreamy love part of me that was thinking maybe, maybe, just maybe there's an explanation for all of this. You kind of hang on to that little bit of hope because it's so hard to wrap your head around the reality that it's all a lie. That's on the next episode of Dr. Death, Miracle Man. From Wondery, this is episode two of six of Dr. Death, season three, Miracle Man. I'm your host, Laura Beal. Producer is Nika Singh, who also reported this story. Fact-checking by Jacqueline Coletti. Production assistance from Fiona Pestana. Managing producer is Lata Pandya. Music supervisor is Scott Velasquez. Sound design by Salt. Our executive producers are George Lavender, Marshall Louie, and Jen Sargent for Wondery. You're about to hear a preview of Killer Psyche. While you're listening, make sure to follow Killer Psyche on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or you can listen to new episodes early and ad-free by joining Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. I'm Candace DeLong. With a career spanning nearly five decades as a psychiatric nurse and FBI criminal profiler, I've sat across the table from hundreds of criminals and spent countless hours inside their minds. Now, in each episode of Killer Psyche, I'll unravel the psychology and motivation behind America's most complex and disturbing figures. Christopher Dunch was a malignant narcissist, and they are very skilled at getting other people to do what they want. 
Ted Kaczynski was a killer with a cause, and that's the most dangerous kind of killer. Not unusual for serial killers to try to make the police look bad. The DC sniper's message was, the police can't protect you. And they were right. I've spent my whole life learning about criminals, what they think and how they think. And now you will too. From Wondery, the company behind Dr. Death and the Apology Line, and Treefort Media, this is Killer Psyche. Listen on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or to listen to episodes ad-free and one week early, join Wondery Plus in the Wondery app.